So I think quite a lot of you know me already. Um, I'm Dr. Aviva Dorch. I'm the executive director of Jewish Renaissance. Um, for those who don't, it's a real pleasure to have you here as part of this session. We have an ongoing series of Zooms linked to the content of the magazine and also linked to other events that we do throughout the year. So recently, in the last but one issue of the magazine, we had a conversation between Tracy Ann Oberman and Henry Goodman. Um, Henry played Shylock many years ago in Nick Heitner's production. Tracy Ann is about to play Shylock, the first female Shylock um, at Stratford-upon-Avon, and then later on in the year will transfer to London to Wilson's Music Hall. So next week, we are going to meet Tracy and Tracy Ann in person. We're all going to we're going to take a group up. If you've signed up, I'm really looking forward to seeing you. And we're going to watch a production of The Merchant of Venice set in Cable Street, which I think will give it an interesting spin, as well as the fact, obviously, that the gender swap will add yet another dimension. So in preparation for that, obviously you can go read the magazine and read what Tracy Ann and Henry Goodman wanted to say about it. But we also thought we'd invite one of our experts, Professor um, Dr. Pam Pallad, who is going to be coming with us on the trip. And she's going to talk to us a little bit tonight about The Merchant of Venice, as well as taking questions. I'm really delighted to have her here. Um, and then she's going to be accompanying with us as well, so we can have a chat to her on the trip itself. But I want to start off um, before Pam introduces The Merchant of Venice and this question of whether Shakespeare was or was not anti-Semitic. I wanted to introduce Pam. So Dr. Pamela Pallard was born in South Africa, but she's talking to us from Israel. So first of all, we should just warn you, if there are any technical hitches, we do apologise. She will jump back on. But um, even though Israel is a high tech society, the Wi-Fi isn't always reliable. So just a little caveat in advance. But Pamela is joining us from Israel, where she came to live in 1975 at the age of 17. And it was at the Hebrew University she studied English literature and teaching. And then she got a doctorate in Shakespeare from bar -Ilan. Um, And her doctorate, she was just telling myself and Emma, was about the gender swaps in Shakespeare. So, of course, The Merchant of Venice was one of the plays she thought about and wrote about. Um, Pamela teaches widely. Um, she gives lectures on Shakespeare all over Israel and abroad. But she's a journalist. Um, we know her because she writes a regular letter from Israel in Jewish Renaissance. Um, you can often see her in the her, her articles in the opening pages. But she's also published several books. Um with intriguing titles, I have to say. How to have a husband and live with your lover at the same time. Um, the first, then For the Love of God and Virgins, and Three Ladies, Three Lattes, which sounds intriguing. Currently, her new book, which we are currently serialising jointly with the Jerusalem Post, though, is on a very different topic. It's called Doing the Daff While Israel Implodes. Um, the Daff obviously being Daff Yomi, a Daff of a page of Talmud. So we've been serialising the beginning of her book about studying the Talmud in this way during the current Israeli political crisis. And you can read the full book too. We'll put a link to it later in the chat if you want to actually read the whole book itself. So you can get a taste on Jewish Renaissance's blog. You can get a taste on the Jerusalem Post's website, but you can read the whole book at the link we'll give you. Um, so a woman of many talents, a woman interested in many different types of literature, but we're really delighted that today she's talking to us about Shakespeare. So over to Dr. Pam Pellard. 
Thank you. Thank you, Aviva. And thank you, Emma, and to Jewish Renaissance. I'm really looking forward to meeting the people who are coming with us next week. It should be great. I'll just say that my book's being serialized in the Jerusalem Report, not in the Jerusalem Post, um, for reasons which I can easily... <laughs> no, but it, for reasons which I can talk about at great length, but I think that's a different a different um, topic. So um, Tracy Ann Oberman, as you said, Aviva, is playing Shylock as a single Jewish mother in the Cable Street riots of 1936 in London. Um, I, I don't know much about her 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 reasons except what I've read on the internet you know she says the regendering of Shakespeare gives an opportunity to look at misogyny as well as anti-semitism um, she's got a very interesting take and I think maybe we'll discuss that after we've seen the play it will be interesting of course as Aviva also mentioned there are two cases in the Merchant of Venice of women dressing up as men um, and this links with something that I'm going, the ratio of difference, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, the only link that I have to the Cable Street riots is that my father-in-law, who was then John Feigenbaum in 1936, was walking home from work in London. My late husband came from London and he got um, caught up in the Cable Street riots. He was a very sort of reserved and gentle man. And he certainly was not going to get involved in any of the of the rioting, but somehow he was attacked and police were onto him and, and the, the black shirts who were attacking him. And they put them all into jail for the night. And nobody knew where John was. Obviously, he, he, there were no phones. Um, he disappeared for the night and it really traumatized him. And the next morning, as he was being released from jail, one of the black shirts said to him, we're going to get you, Feigenbaum. We we after you. And he came home and changed his name to Field. So that was quite a personal um, little anecdote that I know about the Cable Street riots. Um, we'll see how it all works out in Stratford, how she does it. I'm, I'm excited to see it. it. It should be good. So... I just wanted to start by saying that the Merchant of Venice, the, the story of the Merchant of Venice never seems to go away. The anti-Semitism, uh, the issues that Shakespeare brings up. Quite a number of years ago, there was some anniversary, I think it was 400 years since Shakespeare's birth or his death. The Globe Theatre put on all the plays in different languages. Um, Everybody, every every country got a play and one country put it on in Italian and in Spanish, etc. And Israel, of course, got the Jewish play and they put on the Camry Theatre, put on the Merchant of Venice in Hebrew at the Globe. Some of you might have been. It was about 15 years ago. And it was very dramatic because Emma Thompson, who I just love so much, she's such a fabulous actress, but she was one of the leading petitioners not to have Israel come to, to the globe, to, to boycott, unfortunately. Um, and I was, I, I was just, um, I was interested in, in the, the production and I was invited to come and see the dress rehearsal just before they went to London. And it was actually chilling because um, they were expecting riots and demonstrations. In the end, they weren't People came to the Globe apparently wearing um, cel um, masking tape across their mouths as though they've been stopped from demonstrating. And in the middle, somebody took out a Palestinian flag. But um, the Camry Theatre, as they were practicing, were making all sorts of contingency plans, what they would do if they were attacked in the middle of performing The Merchant of Venice. And it, to me, it was really, it was heartbreaking how these issues sort of never go away. Anyway, we'll, um, I want to talk uh, a little bit about the play itself, not, not the new version of it, but the actual play, because I think if we know what Shakespeare was out to talk about, then we'll be able to see what Tracy Ann Oberman, how she's dealt with the original play. So first of all, it's very, very easy to paint a picture of Shakespeare as an anti-Semite. You know, in Macbeth, 
for example, when the witches are making their noxious potion, you remember, and they're throwing double, double toil and trouble, you remember, into the into this potion, they intone as they throw liver of blaspheming Jew. You remember? Liver of blaspheming Jew. Benedict finds out that um, Beatrice loves him in Much Ado About Nothing. And he says, I will love her so brilliantly. And if I don't, I'm a horrible Jew. People always say in the plays, often say, if I don't do what I'm supposed to do, if I'm not a good person, then I'm a Jew. I can give you lots of, lots of examples. In The Merry Wives of Windsor, for example, um, when Mistress Page gets a love letter from the lascivious Falstaff, she looks at the letter and she says, oh, what a herod of jury is this. Where she links Falstaff with a horrible Jew, we don't know. Even Othello gets into the act. Um, Othello, just before he commits suicide, when he realizes what he's done, when he killed his innocent wife, Desdemona, he says, um, I am like a base Judean who threw away a pearl. A base Judean. Look what a terrible man I am, just like a horrible Jew. Um, some editors amend this to a base Indian, but most texts till today have a base Judean. The meaning is clear. It's an infidel, a misbeliever, and there are lots of there are lots of other other examples in in um, two gentlemen of Verona. One servant invites another servant to come and have a drink with him, and he says, "If you don't, you're a Jew, a horrible Jew." You know, it was and and Henry the Fourth says a similar thing to Falstaff. There are many many examples. It's easy to say Shakespeare was an anti Semite, but. Ah, it's fascinating to know what um, what was going on in England at the time, why Shakespeare would have um, sort of related to this question of, of Jews. I think today, it's interesting, when I started lecturing about Shakespeare and the Jews many years ago, I think many people didn't know how that the Jews had all been kicked out of England in 1290 by King Edward I. I think today, actually, more people do know about this. Nobody really knows why the Jews were kicked out, all of them. Nobody knows how many Jews were living in England at the time. They could have been 2,000. They could have been 20,000. It was 1,000 years ago, and the historical records are sketchy. But there's no doubt that King Edward woke up one morning and kicked all the Jews out of England. It was a terrible business. He first summoned the leaders of the, the heads of the community to the palace where he killed them. And then the rest of the Jews had a day to get their things together and get onto ships and be banished to Europe. Um, it's the only example of mass deportation ever to take place from England. And that was the Jews. There's many reasons that it could have happened. I'm not going to go into that. One of the reasons is that King Edward loved the Crusades. He loved the Holy Land and he needed a, a lot, a lot of money for his Crusades. And he probably got the money from the Jewish moneylenders and there was no way that he could pay them back. So he kicked them out of the country. There's two versions of when they left the country. Um, one of the captains of one of the ships carrying the Jews um, the Thames, the, the tide went out and the ship was sort of beached and the captain said to the Jews on board, imagine they'd lost their husbands and fathers the day before and they were kicked out of their houses and they were clinging to their kids. And he said, you can get off the ship and go for a little walk. And many of them did that, leaving, of course, all their belongings and their valuables and their money on board and then the tide came back in and they came back to climb back onto the ship and the captain climbed up and pulled the ladder up and sailed away leaving the Jews to drown and 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 die um some of them and uh, you, you, there's different um reports about how King Edward greeted that news but that's also a, a different story but what is important is that when Shakespeare wrote his play for 300 years, there hadn't been any Jews in England. So, you know, why were they still so terribly hated if nobody had seen a Jew for 10 generations? But hated, they certainly were. 
I'm not sure if you know that um, the whole question of Jews and, and horrible Jews and Jews who castrated Gentiles, this was a big subject on the Elizabethan stage. Did you know that there were 60 other plays, 60, about Jews and Jewish moneylenders on the stage at the time when Shakespeare wrote The Merchant of Venice? So it's interesting to um, remember that in Shakespeare's day, theatre was the place where issues of the day were discussed. It was, if you want, the social media of the day. So Shakespeare had to discuss issues of feminism, and he had to discuss issues of kingship and government, and he had to discuss the Jews, because that was a central um, topic that was being discussed by many of the plays um, in, the, in the time. So Elizabethans had very, you know, even though they hadn't seen Jews, they knew, they believed that Jews had killed Christ. They knew about Jews being moneylenders in Europe. Of course, Jews had to be the moneylenders because Christians, Jesus forbade Jews, um, forbade Christians to even ask for your principal back if you lent money. I think everyone knows this. If someone came to you and said, have you got a hundred pounds to lend me? And you lent him a hundred pounds in Christianity, by the laws of Christianity, you can't even ask for that hundred pounds back. Never mind not asking for interest, but you can't even ask for your principal back. So when somebody came to a Christian and said, can you lend me a hundred pounds? Obviously they would say, oh, sorry fresh out of money today. Obviously, no one's going to lend money if you can't even get back your principal. And so Jews were forced to be the money lenders. And they used to take a lot of interest. And this used to drive the Christians completely crazy. They would say, these bloody Jews, they sit in their homes, they give us their money, they do nothing. And a year later, we give them back money with so much interest. So for that reason, and for the reason that they was, was supposed to be the Christ killers. Jews were detested throughout the ages. Um, Elizabethans thought the Jews smelt different. They had a bad smell. They thought they committed ritual murder, you know, the blood libel of killing the Christians and baking their uh, little Christians' blood into matzot. They had an interesting thought. They knew that women went to the mikvah to purify themselves after they, they had menstruated. So they knew as well that men went to the mikvah on a Friday. They didn't know that that was to sort of get themselves ready for Shabbat. So there was this theory among some Christians that Jewish men also menstruated and poor things once a week. So they'd have to go every week to the, and then, you know, they would be, they wouldn't, they would have to replenish their blood by drinking the blood of Christians. There were crazy myths about these supposedly terrible Jews. Um, the Jews returned in the 1650s, Cromwell let them in, but even in by the time Merchant of Venice was written, there were Jewish Muranos starting to trickle back into, you know, the hidden Jews, the conversios, they were starting to trickle back into England. And there is um there is a, 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 a whole theory that one of Shakespeare's lovers was Emilia del Bassanio, a Jewish woman. So I just have to tell you something here and diverge for a minute. Um, my friend Angie is on the on the Zoom somewhere. And she when she was living in Brussels, she organized me a lecture tour to Brussels. And um <laughs> I came and I spoke to a group of um, non-Jewish British expats who were living in Brussels. So I was telling them all the background about the Jews, etc. And then I said to them, so there's a very convincing case to be made. I won't tell you all the history of Emilia del Bassanio now, but there's a very convincing case to be made that um, Shakespeare's lover was actually Jewish. And I said, and now in Israel, Angie, do you remember? I said, and now in Israel, the, uh, the Shakespeare scholars are working very hard to actually prove that Shakespeare himself was also Jewish. And I, not one person cracked a smile. There was zero reaction. 
everyone looked at me absolutely stony faced. And at the in, at the at the end of the lecture, somebody called me and she said to me, just what did you mean when you said that in Israel you're trying to prove that Shakespeare himself was Jewish? So I said it was a joke. It was a joke. So she said it wasn't at all funny. <laughs> so that's my that's my memory of trying to prove that Shakespeare was Jewish. Okay, so there was a lot more going on, on in Elizabeth's time. Her doctor was Rodrigo Lopez, who was a Murano, and he was falsely accused of trying to poison Queen Elizabeth for long involved story he wasn't. He was framed. Um, he'd been falsely accused, but anyway, he was he was executed and he was known to be a Murano Jew. So that brought up the whole thing that Jews were traitors. Um, it, it's quite sad to see how many hundreds of years the same tropes have been continuing. For example, there was a guy called Thomas Corioto in Queen Elizabeth's court, and he said that he'd never seen a Jew. And he said that the colloquial definition of a Jew was sometimes a weather-beaten, warp-faced fellow, sometimes a frenetic and lunatic person, sometimes one discontented. Okay, warp-faced, frenetic, ghastly. And then he went to Venice and he went to a Bet Knesset there, he went to a synagogue and he saw some Jews, some beautiful, well-dressed Jews. And he said, um, he saw them, he called them goodly and proper men and beautiful women. And he said, it's a most lamentable case for a Christian to consider the damnable estate of these miserable Jews. So you can see that you just can't win. If you warp face, that's bad. If you're beautiful and successful, that's bad. Just being Jewish in those days and often in some parts of the world today just is bad. Um, Lots of people wrote about Jews. In 1539, a theologian called Sebastian Munster wrote that you Jews have a peculiar color of face different from the form and figure of other men. Okay, we look completely different. Andrew Willett, this is a very interesting one and I think my favorite. He was also a theologian and he wrote in 1550, a Jew though, whether he journeys into Spain or France, declare, declares himself to be not a Spaniard or a Frenchman, but a Jew. So that's, I'm sure all of us living abroad um, have, ha have encountered this feeling of dual loyalties are you British first? Are you are you Jewish first? You remember, I'm sure you've seen the movie Golda, um, where Kissinger says to Golda, remember, I'm American first and Secretary of State second and Jew third. And she says to him, Henry, you've forgotten that in Israel we, we, we read from left to right. Um, so that's the, that's the, I remember that from living in South Africa, the feeling of dual loyalty um, as Israel sort of collapses today at least we still have the feeling that you know we don't have to deal with that but that's another lecture um, so this was the background to Merchant of Venice Shakespeare wrote Merchant of Venice two years after Marlowe's The Jew of Malta he was kind of answering Marlowe it's easy to say it's just another anti-Semitic play and you can make a very good case. Yes, it's an anti-Semitic play. It's horrible. But I think, and this is what I want to show you tonight, I think there's an equally good argument to be made that he wasn't anti-Semitic. In fact, the opposite. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to talk about that for a minute. So first of all, I want to give you the first slide and just remind us. Next one. Characters. Just remind us of the just remind us of the of the of the plot of the play. So the merchant of Venice is Antonio. Antonio is a Christian merchant of Venice. He's a very rich man. Next slide. Um, and he has a friend called Bassanio. And they're very close friends. Bassanio is younger than Antonio. 
Bassanio, it, it seems probable and possible that they had a homosexual relationship. That's another whole story um, about Shakespeare's own sexuality, but we won't go into that tonight. So the, Antonio is very wealthy and Bassanio is his friend or his lover and Bassanio is very poor. And Bassanio, um, Bassanio is in love possibly also with Antonio or possibly he's just using Antonio for his money. But and Bassanio is in love with Portia and Portia is this beautiful woman and extremely insanely rich she lives in the in the island of belmont just outside venice and she doesn't have parents her parents have died she's inherited all their money and she's single and everybody in the world wants to marry portia because she's rich she's beautiful and she's good okay she's everything in that order that's how they describe her rich beautiful good so um, everybody, suitors are coming from all over the world to try and marry Portia. And Portia's father knew that unsuitable men would come and try to marry her. And so he had some sort of a trick to, uh, a test, let's say. He had a test to make sure that only the most suitable man married her. And his test was that um, there would be three caskets in a room, a gold casket a silver casket and a lead casket and you had to choose one each suitor had to choose one casket if you chose the wrong one you had to promise never ever to get married again so that was quite a big thing to promise um and if you never got married you know it was it was it would make separate the men from the boys people come and try to choose the right casket but you need a lot of money you have to stay in Belmont you have to bring your servants you have to have ships so Bassanio asks Antonio to lend him money 3,000 ducats so that he can go to to Belmont and try and woo Portia Antonio says with pleasure I will do anything for you Antonio is obviously a little bit sad that Bassanio wants to get married to Portia but he loves him so much that he says I'll do anything for you but he hasn't got any money because although he's tremendously wealthy his money is all tied up he he has ships and some of his ships are in Italy and some are in Mexico and he's got ships all over the world he doesn't have enough money to give um, Bassanio cash of 3000 ducats so he says no problem we'll go and give them get the money from the money lender shylock okay shylock is a money lender in venice everybody hates him because he's rich and he takes a lot of interest and they come to shylock and they ask him for 3000 ducats which shylock gives them um i i just wanted to mention that um shakespeare never except for The Tempest, his last play, Shakespeare never wrote his own plots. He always takes plots from other people's plays or folk stories or all sorts of places. And the, the test, the test with the three caskets was actually taken from an earlier draft of a, of a, a similar play. But that test wasn't three caskets. The original text was that um, Portia would have supper with her suitor. And then she'd say, okay, come and spend the night with me in my bed. And if you satisfy me in the morning, I'll allow you to marry me. And I think everyone can quite comfortably agree that that was a much more suitable te test, don't you think, than choosing a casket. Um, but the the audience of... Um, she, she, of course, knew exactly what she was doing. She used to drug the wine of each of the suitors so they would get into her bed and flake out, except when she finally liked someone, she didn't drug, drug his wine. But Shakespeare's audience was becoming quite puritanical, and he thought that wouldn't work if he put a test like that, and so he changed it to the caskets. Then there's Jessica, Shylock's daughter, Jessica is obviously Jewish, and she runs away with Lorenzo, a Christian, who seduces her and takes her to be his wife. She runs away stealing a lot of her father's money, which is a clear reference to Abigail, who steals money from Barabbas in Christopher Marlowe's The Jew of Malta. But 
that's a, also, I'm so sorry. I would love to go into all these things, but I, I can't. So, um, okay, I do know, let me stop sharing. I do know that uh, in, in Tracy Ann Oberman's production, Antonio is a Mosley, a Mosleyite, is that what you say? Um, a, a follower of Mosley. He's an aristocratic Mosley follower. So that'll be interesting to see. Um, I want to suggest that the Merchant of Venice, and I'm not, again, I'm really not sure how she's going to play it and how she's going to interpret it, but I want to suggest that the Merchant of Venice is one of the most groundbreaking plays ever to be written in English. I think that it's one of the first plays that erases difference. It takes the other and it says, look at the other. The other is not so different from me. And he does this on three levels. First of all, there were also, and unfortunately that's a different subject, there was also the question of blacks and whites. You know, there was the play Othello, of course, and and there were lots of plays. It's, it's, there were not many blacks in, in England at the time, but Queen Elizabeth I was very upset about the number of blacks that have crept into my realm, and she wanted to deport them all. Um, and, sh and Shakespeare tackles this question of race. And the first suitor that comes to try and woo Portia is a Moor. And she is a racist, Portia. And when he chooses the wrong casket, she says, go, go, go. May all of his complexion choose me so. She doesn't want a black husband. But the Moor, the suitor, has a beautiful, beautiful speech before he chooses the casket. And he says, and mislike me not for my complexion. He says to Portia, he knows she's a racist. And he says to her, mislike me not for my complexion. Don't hate me because I'm dark, he says to her. And then he explains that people who live in Africa are closer to the sun and they have to have darker faces to protect them from the rays of the, the, of the hot sun. But he says, let us make incision for my blood, for your love. Let us make incision in my arm. Let me cut my arm and look at the blood that's flowing beneath my skin. And you will see that this blood is the same red as blood that flows in the fairest of fair suitor skins. Look, that is, you know, today we we pretty used to um, togetherness and, and accepting the other, but for Shakespeare, in Shakespearean times, that was incredibly brave thing to say and groundbreaking. Nobody was saying that blacks are the same as whites. So that's the first thing. The second um, erasure of difference, and here this is what Aviva was speaking about um, with the with the gender, the, you know, the, the cross-dressing. Two of the women in the play, Portia and her, um, her servant, Nerissa, both cross-dress in the play. What happens is that Shylock lends his the 3,000 ducats and he says, I won't even take interest. I'm going to show you that I'm doing this out of the goodness of my heart. Antonio, take the money. And if you can't pay it back in three months' time, I want a pound of your fair flesh cut off from that part of your body that pleaseth me. Now, this is also interesting because flesh was Elizabethan slang for the male sexual organ. And everybody knows where Jews cut cut for circumcision. So when he said a pound of your fair flesh, everybody in the audience rolled about in the aisles with laughter because they thought that he was going to cut off a pound of flesh from you know where if Antonio forfeited on his bond. Um, Antonio's ships all come to grief, pirates and shipwrecks and, and all kinds of terrible storms, all kinds of terrible things happen. He's left a bankrupt, prodigal, just no money whatsoever. And Shylock claims his bond. And he says, I want, he, it's also another interesting thing. He says he wants his pound of flesh cut off from close to his heart, 
which is a transference from circumcision to the circumcision of the heart. Um, Christianity says that their kids don't have to be physically circumcised. It must be a circumcision of the heart. So this play is working on very many interesting levels. Anyway, he can't get his, his he, he, uh, Shylock absolutely dramatically refuses to take any amount of money. He wants his bond. And they're about to kill Antonio to give a pound of flesh when Portia and Nerissa arrive in the courtroom. And they are cross-dressed as men and they save the day. We'll get to that later on how they save the day, but they save the day. Everybody else is useless. Um, and Antonio can't save himself. Bassanio can't save him. He's about to die. I saw this play once I took another group to Stratford and I saw this play put on by the um, Royal Shakespeare Company. And it was really, it was just a, a horrible play. It was horribly, it was horrible to watch. He Shylock was like a Haredi sort of Hasid in the whole garb. And he, with his big nose, it was really horrible. And he was sharpening his knife and you could see him frothing at the mouth, wanting to kill Antonio. And then Portia and Larissa arrive cross-dressed. And you remember what they say and how they save the day. They say, take your pound of flesh, Shylock. And he takes his knife. He's been sharpening it and it's ghastly and Antonio is sweating and Bassanio is crying and um, Bassanio and Antonio both Bassanio and Graciano they are the very new husbands of Portia and Nerissa and Portia and Nerissa are in the courtyard are you following it's very complicated Portia and Nerissa are there to save the day dressed up as lawyers and both Bassanio and his servants say, I'm recently married and I wish my wife was dead. I wish my wife was dead and in heaven so that she could speak to God and ask God to save your life, Antonio. And Portia and Larissa are there. And they say, hmm, I'm sure your wife wouldn't be happy to hear that. Anyway, they save the day. They say you can take your pound of flesh, but not one drop of blood. If you shed one drop of blood, that's not in the contract, you die. And they say, have you got a scales? Because you can take your pound of flesh, but if you take even one hair's weight, too much or too little, you die. Make sure it's an exact pound of flesh. And um, Shylock, of course, can't take an exact pound of flesh without taking any blood. And he gives up on his bond and then he gets very badly punished. But the point is that two women save the day. And this raises the question of what is the status of women? And another, this is a fascinating and super groundbreaking discussion because up to then on the Elizabethan stage, women were simply portrayed as useless. They All they would do if you married them was take your money. They would Talk, 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 talk till they drove you nuts. They they would sleep with your best friend. They were completely not to be trusted and bad. It was a, women were a necessary evil. And here comes Shakespeare, and he has 12 cross-dressed women in his plays, including two in The Merchant of Venice. And he erases the difference between women and men. When Bassanio finally marries Portia, she gives this speech of abrogation and adoration. She says, you see me here, Lord Bassanio. I'm an unschooled girl. What am I? I'm useless and I'm not clever. And everything that I own is yours. She just pours out her heart to him. And she says, you can have my house. She's tremendously wealthy and he's got nothing. And she says, all my money is your money and my house is your house and my servants are your servants. And one page later, she is completely in control, telling him, you go there, you do this, you wait for me. And then she disguises herself as a man, goes to Venice and saves the day. So you can see that I, I think that at least there's a very good case to be made that Shakespeare thinks that women are entirely as capable as men if not more capable. So you can see that he erases the difference, 
I, th I think, between blacks and whites, between men and women. And now we, the subject that we are going to look at for a few minutes is how he does this between Jews and Christians. So I'm going to show you the famous speech. Um, okay. I hope you can all see it. So this is where Antonio comes to Shylock and he says, Shylock, I want 3,000 ducats. Will you lend us 3,000 ducats? And Shylock says, Signor Antonio, many a time and oft in the Rialto you have rated me. It means you have berated me. You have scolded me about my monies and my usances, about my usury, lending money. You've told me I'm bad to do it. It's disgusting. Still have I borne it with a patient shrug. I've always borne it with a patient shrug, for sufferance is the badge of all our tribe. You call me misbeliever, cutthroat dog, and spat upon my Jewish gabardine, and all for use of that which is mine own. I was only using my own money, and you spat at me, and you called me misbeliever. Oh, sorry. Well, then. Sorry, I'm just getting this. Well, then, it now appears you need my help. Go to then. You come to me and you say, Shylock, we would have monies. You say so. You that did void your room upon my beard. One day you spit at me and foot me as you spurn a stranger cur over your threshold. You kick me like you kick a dog. Monies is your suit. What should I say to you? Should I not say, hath a dog money? Is it possible a cur can lend 3,000 ducats? Or shall I bend low and in a bondsman's key with a humble slave's voice, with bated breath and whispering humbleness, say this, Fair sir, you spat at me on Wednesday last. You spurned me such a day. Another time you called me dog. And for these courtesies, I lend thee thus much monies. Is that what you would like me to say? Thank you for spitting at me. Let me give you some money. And Antonio says an interesting thing. You would expect him to say, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have spoken to you like that. I apologize. Please lend me money. But he doesn't. Antonio looks at Shylock and says, I am as like to call thee so again, to spit on thee again, to spurn thee too. If thou wilt lend this money, lend it not as to thy friends. For when did friendship take a breed for barren metal of his friend? But lend it rather to thine enemy, who, if he break, thou mayst with better face exact the penalty. So, what, is, what does Antonio say? I'm not your friend. I hate you. Lend it to me as your enemy. And then if I can't pay you back, take the penalty. And this is where Shylock says, no, why do you storm? I'm trying to make peace with you. I'm not going to give you, take any interest. I'll give you 3,000 ducats. And if you can't pay me back, a pound of your flesh. And Bassanio, to his credit, says, you can't sign such a thing, Antonio, for me. And Antonio says, don't be silly. My ships are coming back a month before the day. My ships will all be back in two months' time, and I've got three months to pay the bond. It's fine. And they sign to the bond, right, which is, of course, the, the crux of the, of the plot. Um, so... Um, and then, of course, they can't pay back the bond. And now comes the, the, the question. Some people see the Merchant of Venice as the difference between Christian, um, what's the word? Forgiveness. Christian, you know, turn the other cheek. Christian, um, there's a different word from forgiveness. It's it, it, Jewish justice, an eye for an eye. And Christian 
forgiveness, let's say, turning the other cheek. And some people say, look at the wonderful Christians. They are ready to forgive and forget. And look at the terrible Jews. He wants his pound of flesh. He's owed his pound of flesh. And he will take his pound of flesh from Antonio. And I think you can obviously see it that way. But I think there's a different way of seeing this play. Because Shylock says, I want my pound of flesh. But he has a motive I would think I would also possibly want my pound of flesh if someone had been spitting on me and kicking me. And there were more terrible things that Antonio had done to him. Sometimes Shylock had a business deal and Antonio came and said, I'll give you the money for free just to undercut Shylock's business. Shylock had, uh, Antonio had for many years been doing everything to stick it to Shylock and make Shylock lose money. And now he can't pay back. But there's another motive. In the meanwhile, at the same time as Antonio has lost all his money, Jessica has been stolen away. She, she, she wasn't really stolen. She's left of her own free will. But she says, I hate being a Jew. I hate my father's house. What's wrong with me? But I want to be a Christian. And off she goes. And before, she also cross dresses, by the way, to escape. And before she goes, she stands at his the window and she throws down boxes of ducats and jewelry that, that Shylock has amassed. And she wipes him out of a lot of, of his money. And she throws this to her Christian husband, including a ring that Shylock's wife gave him when Leah gave him when they were engaged. And Shylock is so upset. Jessica's his only daughter. He thinks she's been stolen by the Christians. He's furious and he wants revenge. He says, why shouldn't I get revenge? If Jews wrong Christians, what happens? The Christians take revenge. Why shouldn't I take revenge? Okay, so I want to show you that most famous speech. Okay, um, Antonio can't pay back his bond. He's been taken to jail because Shylock has to get his pound of flesh. Shylock is waiting for this pound of flesh. And two of the two Italians are walking in the street. And one of them, Solanio, says, I never heard a passion so confused, so strange, outrageous, and so variable as the dog Jew did utter in the streets. This is just after Jessica has run away and Solanio saw Shylock pacing the streets screaming. And this is what Shylock was saying. My daughter, oh my ducats, oh my daughter, fled with a Christian, oh my Christian ducats, justice the law, my ducats and my daughter. The Christian Solanio conflates um. Shylock's pain, the same pain about his daughter and his ducats. It's not a very um, flattering portrait of a man who's just lost his daughter and he's equally upset about losing his ducats, but that's what they say. My daughter, oh my ducats, oh my daughter, etc. A sealed bag, two sealed bags of ducats, of double ducats stolen from, from me by my daughter, and jewels, two stones, two rich and precious stones stolen by my daughter. Um, the sealed bag and the stones are obviously metaphors, sexual metaphors um, for sexual, the sexual organs of, of men. And um, what they're trying to say is that Jessica has emasculated her father. She's stolen his masculinity by stealing his his money. Stolen by my daughter. Justice, find the girl. She hath the stones upon her, that's the same metaphor, and the ducats. And then another um, Italian sees Shylock. Shylock walks on stage and he says, how now Shylock? What news among the merchants? And Shylock says, you knew. None so well, none so well as you of my daughter's flight. 
Why didn't you warn me? Why didn't you stop her? And Solarino says, that's certain. I, for my part, knew the tailor that made the wings she flew with all. I know who stole her. And Solanio says, and Shylock, for his own part, knew the bird was fledged. And then it is the complexion of them all to leave the dam. The image of a little bird leaving the mother bird, the dam. And Shylock plays on the word dam and says, she is damned for it. And Solanio says, that's certain if the devil may be her judge. If you judge her, then she's going to be judged by the devil. Jews were always the devil. And Shylock says, my own flesh and blood to rebel. And here Solanio says a very cruel thing. I told you that flesh was Elizabethan slang for the male genitals. And Solanio pretends to understand that Shylock is now saying that he's sexually aroused. Shylock is busy mourning his daughter and mourning his money. He's Definitely no one could think that he's thinking about having sex at this particular point. And Solanio says, out upon it, old carrion, rebels it at these years, really? And Shylock says, you idiot. I say, my daughter is my flesh and blood. And Solarino says, there's more difference between thy flesh and hers than between jet and ivory. More between your bloods than there is between red wine and Rhenish. But tell us. Do you hear whether Antonio have had any loss at sea or no? And Shylock says, here I have another bad match. It's all conflated. He loses his daughter. He loses his money. And Antonio, who owes him so much money, has lost all his ships. A bankrupt, a prodigal, who dare scarce show his head on the Rialto. A beggar that was used to come so smug upon the mart. He used to come to the market so smugly and say terrible things to me. And then Shylock says, let him look to his bond. He was wont to call me usurer. Let him look to his bond. You can see that there's a clear motive and revenge. He's got a reason for wanting this pound of flesh. He was wont to lend money for a Christian courtesy. Let him look to his bond. And Solanio says, why? I am sure if he forfeit, thou wilt not take his flesh. What's that good for? And here come the lines, of course, that everyone knows off by heart. What do you need his pound of flesh for? And Shylock says, to bait fish withal. If it will feed nothing else, it will feed my revenge. He hath disgraced me and hindered me half a million, laughed at my losses, mocked my gains, scorned my nation, thwarted my bargains, cooled my friends, heated mine enemies. And what's his reason? I am a Jew. Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions? Fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed, oh, sorry, healed by the same means, warmed by the same, now I can't see the words because, by the same summer and winter and summer as a Christian is? beautiful words and here come the famous lines if you prick us do we not bleed if you tickle us do we not laugh if you poison us do we not die and if you wrong us shall we not revenge if we are like you in the rest we will resemble you in that if a jew wrong a christian what is his humility revenge if a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be by Christian example? Why? Revenge. The villainy you teach me I will execute and it shall go hard, but I will better the instruction. Um, you know, these words are so iconic. I make all my students learn them off by heart. Um, I think the Nazis put on the, the Merchant of Venice to show how terrible and money-grabbing and ghastly Jews were. They used it as a propaganda play. But obviously they cut this very 
crucial speech. So I find that it's hard to present Shakespeare as an anti-Semite if he gives such a, to me, such a totally clear speech of the erasure of difference. We are just like you. We've got the same bodies. We hurt by this. We warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer. You prick us. We also bleed just like you. If we wrong you, you get revenge. And if you wrong us, we get revenge. There's another one last speech that two little speeches that I'll quickly show you. The one is that in the courtroom, Shylock stands up and he says, you keep telling me to show mercy. You keep telling me to turn the other cheek and, and forgive him and say, I don't want my pound of flesh. But what should I say to you? All of you have slaves. And why? What do you do to your slaves? Do you say to them, come and sleep in my bed, marry my daughter, let me feed you the same delicious food as I get served every night? No. Why not? Because they are your slaves. You've bought them. And he says, this pound of flesh is mine and it's dearly bought. When you let all your slaves go and, you know, make them all free men just like you, then you can come and latif musar, as we say in Hebrew, then you can come and tell me what I should do and moralize. So again, he's erasing difference. He's not saying Jews are good and he's not saying Christians are bad. He's saying everyone's the same. You do these things, we do these things, we are the same. There's one last speech that I want to show you. Um, just before Portia comes up with her idea of, you know, saving the day, you can't spill one drop of blood and you can't take one hair's weight more or less than the pound of flesh. Before she pulls this card out of her pack, she has one last try and she again says these beautiful words. You know them. The quality of mercy is not strained. When I was 12 years old, my mother took me to the park, Happy Valley in Port Elizabeth for my first Shakespeare play. And we saw the Merchant of Venice and my mom, who was just the nicest woman in the world. But I think she didn't quite understand this particular nuance um, because maybe it was taught differently in South Africa in those days. She said, listen to the speech, the quality of mercy, and it is a most beautiful speech. Let's have a look at it. Um, Portia is telling Shylock, be merciful. And what does she say about mercy? Let's just see that I can find it. Here, here we go. The quality, she's telling him, be merciful, be merciful. She says, the quality of mercy is not strained. It's a beautiful quality. It's an easy quality. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Tis mightiest in the mightiest. If you have a king or a queen and they merciful, if you've got all the power and you show mercy, then you really being merciful. It's mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. When Diana was alive and Queen Elizabeth, I used to talk about them, you know, she, the crown of majesty and the gentleness and generosity and the quality of mercy. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty, wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. You've got the power and people are scared of you and they, you know, they dread you. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. Um, she says, of course, that mercy is the most important thing. It's like being like God. If you're merciful, that's the most important and the best thing. And it's the most beautiful words. And then he says, no, I want my pound of flesh. And she stops him from getting it. And then you would think only five page earlier, pages earlier, she's been talking about the quality of mercy. You would think she'd show mercy. But boy, oh boy, she goes for the jugular. She says, Shalok, you have to become a Christian. You have to give all your money away, half of it to Antonio and half of it to your daughter. And Shalok says, you know, take my life. You take my life when you did take the props that doth sustain it. I'm going to die of hunger. I'd rather you killed me. And in the end, Antonio gives him a little retainer on condition that he gives that to um, to 
to Jessica as well when he dies. So where is this mercy? She speaks so beautifully. Why doesn't she have this attribute of God? Why doesn't she show it? And I think this is a very cleverly crafted play to show everybody's the same. Um, Shakespeare could not come out sort of chad mashmai without, um, you know, beating about the bush. He couldn't come out and say Jews are the same as us. He would have been booted off the stage. He wouldn't have been, he couldn't, you couldn't fly in the face of all the accepted wisdom of the time. So I think that he writes this beautifully subtle play and in it, he does these three things. He raises the difference between blacks and whites. He raises the difference between Jews and non-Jews. And he raises the difference between men and women. I'll just stop for one quick second to say goodbye to my daughter who's helped me with the technical stuff because now I'm going to the easy part of questions and answers. Thank you. Um, and I, I, I wanted to say one more thing um, about about, oh, I, I just wanted to tell you how the play ends. So the play ends um, with Portia and Nerissa going home, taking off their cross-dressed clothes. They've both given their rings to their husbands. When their husbands went to, um, to, to Venice to try and save Antonio, they both gave their rings to their husbands, and then they both managed to trick their husbands when they were cross-dressed into giving the rings to them. They say, you know, we've saved your friend. What are you going to Bassanio and Antonio come to these two men and they say, what do you want? How can we repay you for saving his life? And they say, we want your rings. And previously they've told their husbands, if you ever lose your rings, we're divorcing you. Don't come home. And they say, we can't give you our rings. We just can't. Sorry. Ask for anything else. I'll give you money to buy 20 rings. And they say, she, the, the wives say, no, give me your rings. What kind of wives have you got? Anyway, the, the end of the play is when the husbands come back without the rings and the wives pretend to believe that the husbands have given the rings to prostitutes. And then there's a big revelation and they explain that they were the men in the courtroom and they saved Antonio's life. And there's more good news. One of his one of his um, fleets of ships has not been destroyed and he's actually got a lot of money and his uh, Portia's wo words drop like manna on the ground below and the play ends with Graciano that's one of the husbands saying to his new wife Nerissa as long as um, I live I shall fear no thing as much as keeping safe Nerissa's ring. That's the last line of the play. And ring, of course, is also slang for the women's sexual organs. And so the play ends on the promise of, of cuddling up with your wife and children to come. And it's poor old Shylock, who has been forced to become a Christian, who's lost all his money, who's really down and out. He's forgotten. No one's showing him mercy. And the play ends on this sort of happy, jocular note. So um, I think that's an, about an hour, exactly an hour. Um, I've got lots more to say about all these subjects, obviously. Um, but I think that if you're not too tired, maybe you'll want to ask me a few questions. Lovely. Thank you so much, Pam. How fascinating. And um just to add with your comment on the play ends with the rings and of course Bassanio and Graciano don't know the value of the rings and are willing to give them away but the thing that Shylock's most upset about Jessica taking is the turquoise ring that he got from his yeah. wife Leah so, yeah, and so we also have the sense of he's the one man in the play who understands that that's a very sad, uh, that's a very sad line. He hears, he sends a sort of a, a spy to see where Jessica is and what she's doing and to try and get back that ring that, that Leah gave him when they were engaged. And the spy tells him that Jessica sold that ring for a monkey or bar bartered that ring for a monkey. And he says, I wouldn't have given it away for a wilderness of monkeys. It was my Leah's ring. Okay. Uh, very sad. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. Well, 
I'm going I have so many questions for you, but I'm going to hold back for a minute because there are people in the um audience who do too. So I'm gonna ask if Mike Lee, Mike, would you like to come on screen? Um, can you put your camera on? Okay. If not, then I'll just read his question mm -hmm. from the chat. Ask me easy questions. <laughs> yeah. Mike, are you there? Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wondered what you um understand by the word sufferance in Shylock's speech. Do, do you understand it to mean tolerance or, or suffering when he says suffering? Suffering. Suffer, suffering in suffering in silence. We manage to, you know, we 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 can tolerate all this trouble. We suffer in silence. Sufferance is the badge. We've had so many troubles and we we know how to deal with them. Fantastic. Thank you. So I called Mike, but I think it's your partner no, in the background who was asking that question. Yes. Um, I'm going to bring Professor John, Joe Goldblatt on screen because he has a very interesting question. Well, first of all, thank you for that brilliant analysis. I'm going to see the play with Tracy Ann Overman the end of November in Manchester, and you have enriched my experience thousandfold already. So thank you. My question is, the Jewish ghetto in Venice was created in about 1516. The play, however, was written about the 1550s. And then some people believe Shakespeare vanished, perhaps to India, <laughs> to Italy, rather, between 1587 and 1592. And I wonder how all these variables might have influenced the merchant of Venice's perception throughout human history? It's a very good question. Nobody knows where Shakespeare went during those lost years. It was two years, actually, that the theatres were, I can't remember exactly, but they were around when you said, when the theatres were closed because of plague. So they, and they don't, there's, there's just no records. They don't know if he went to Italy. And it seems that there's certain details in the play that would seemed to prove that he knew what he was writing about because he knew about the ghetto, but there's certain, and he knew about ducats and he knew about the, the money usury, but there's certain details that would prove the opposite. For example, Shylock had a Christian um, servant called Lancelot and in the actual ghetto, Jews were not allowed to have Christian servants. Another thing is that Shylock invite, or he's invited to have dinner with Antonio and um and some Christian friends. And in the real ghetto, they weren't allowed to eat with Christians. And the ghetto was locked at night. And the Jews were locked inside the ghetto and only allowed to go out. So there's proof that Shylock knew that, sorry, that Shakespeare knew about the ghetto, which would seem to indicate that he'd been there and seen it with his own two eyes. But he, there's lots of inconsistencies, which would prove the opposite. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Nobody knows much about Shakespeare's personal life. They don't know whether he really did get involved with Amelia with Bassanio. Did he have lovers? Didn't he? Was he homosexual? Wasn't he? Was he all those personal things are fascinating. There are zillions of books about it, but there's no definitive answer. And also to your question. Thank you. And good on you for making your students memorize those lines. Keep it up. You know, you know, I teach at the Reichman University and to just insert a little bit of politics, because how can you not? I always I teach public speaking as well and how to present Israel's case, which is getting more and more difficult for me in the last few months, if not well nigh impossible. But we won't we won't go on to that um, subject. And a lot of them go to very hostile colleges, I think, including in, in England, but mostly in the States. And I think that the line about hath not a Jew as is something that they really need to know. Brilliant. I mean, I think we all agree how Absolutely. important that is. And thank you, Pam, for your work doing that. And thank you, Joe, for a great question. I mean, it's very interesting because Jonathan Bates, was fascinated by the choice of Venice that anniversary you talked about with the globe earlier I think it was the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare there was also a big exhibition at the British Museum which he co-curated and he had um 
in the programme book and he would then went on to write a book about Venice as the modern city. Kind of he picked up a lot about kind of what is the choice of Venice and how much is it about the Jewish ghetto and how much of it about what it symbolises in terms of modernness and non-Englishness. I don't know if that's something that interests you. Um, the modernness and non-Englishness. Yeah, the the kinds of what Venice represented in oh, Shakespeare oh, and England. Oh, oh, oh. I, um, I think it also represented a, a romantic. You know, Italy was a place where a lot of his romances were were, and it it was also definitely the other. And it was just a place where there were Jews, because if he'd set it in England, you know, there there weren't Jews in England. Um, that's what I can say about that. I just can I interrupt myself with a little plug for my book, because in the book, um, I also talk about the Talmud, but I also talk a lot about Shakespeare. So, like, for example, I compare Israel today with Scotland under Macbeth, comparing it to Israel under Macbibi. And um, I talk a lot about these things, you know, how you can spin exactly what you were saying, how you can spin countries to have um, significance beyond themselves. So if anyone downloads it and reads it, I would really be happy with any feedback from England. Um, you can email me and it's pelledpam at gmail.com, P-E-L-E-D-P-A-M. And you can, you know, I, I, I'm, it's the, I'm just starting with this book and I'm interested to see what people think about it in England. Lovely, thank you. Okay. Emma has just put the link in the chat, so please do go along and have a look. Um, and we'll put um Pam's email address in the chat as well, so that if any of you have any questions or thoughts about the book, you can be in touch with her, or indeed about Shakespeare and the Merchant of Venice. So I'm just it's it's eight forty. We just have five more minutes left. And we have three more questions. So we're going to do a kind of quick hits, quick fire ones. We have one about the play itself, then a couple that are slightly off topic, but interesting. So let me bring in, first of all, Emma. Emma's our programme producer. That's how you all know her for Jewish Renaissance. She's also a theatre maker who's studied English and drama. So Emma, would you come on screen for us and ask your question? Hi, thank you so much. Um, that was such a fascinating talk. And yes, I did study English literature and The Merchant of Venice, but this is much more detailed than, <laughs> than I think I went into at the time. So thank you. Um, and yeah, so my question was about the kind of theatre or performance context, because you said that there were, you know, 50 or 60 other plays with Jewish characters in them at that time. And I was just wondering if you know if the reception for this one was any different, if people kind of noticed that Shakespeare was doing something a bit different with his Jewish characters in this play. I, I, th I really don't think there's any um, any reception. written stuff about that. Yeah, I, I would imagine that they probably did because people used to, this was what everybody used to go to the plays, as you know, from the commoners to the kings and queens. And this is how people raised issues. Um, so I, I would imagine that they, everyone would have, or many of the audience would have seen um, the Jew of Malta before. And as I said, when Abby, Abigail threw down the, the her caskets below, I think people would have remembered that Jessica um, also threw down the caskets. The difference was that Abigail was um, throwing the caskets of money to her father. She was go she went into his sequestered house and and um what's the word? She repossessed his hidden stash of gold and threw it to him and Shakespeare was doing the opposite. But I think it was must have been clear to people. You know, they'd seen the play two years before and I, I think people must have been comparing and speaking about it. Yeah, but I can't answer that with certainty. But I would like your accent. Can you lend it to me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I got this from. My family doesn't speak like this. Probably while I was studying an English literature degree. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to bring Jackie Savitt 
on screen. Jackie's got a question. I hope you don't mind about a slightly different Shakespeare play. Jackie. Oh, I thought it was another Jackie that I know from Ranana. Hi there. <laughs> Hi. Oh, um, actually, I have a child that lives in Ranana, but that's a, <laughs> a different story. No, I was interested, very interested in Shakespeare. One of my particular favourites is Romeo and Juliet. And as I said, I was looking at the, the cast list and there's um, a man servant, a Montague servant called Abraham. I think he's right at the beginning. There's a bit of um, fighting between him and the Capulets. And I believe there was actually a ghetto in Verona as well. And I was just wondering if there was any significance in the name, because I don't think Shakespeare did anything without significance. So I was just wondering, there's a lot of Italian names and then you get this Abraham. And I just wondered if you knew anything about the background. There's actually, there's some academic papers about Shakespeare's connection um, with the names in Romeo and Juliet that one of those, the, I think it was the Montagues might have been a, a Jewish name. Mm -hmm. There is academic writing about that. I've read some papers. Again, it's not, it's not proved either way. You know, if you Google on the internet, you can, I, I know that there is stuff that tries to link the Montagues or the Capulets, one of the families I've forgotten with with Jewish themes, but it's never developed in Romeo and Juliet. The Jewish aspect isn't developed at all, so people don't really talk about it as a as anything to do with the Jewish with a Jewish theme. There's lots of other beautiful things to talk about with Romeo and Juliet. So maybe one day we'll go and see that in Stratford and 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 talk about that. That's a fabulous play. Well, yes. we'll just have to see. Yes. We, we need to find Thank the you. Jewish link so we can do it as a Jewish Renaissance event. <laughs> well, yeah. Jewish wedding. Bringing... <laughs> there we go. We're bringing it full circle because the final question, which has been put in the chat by Joe, who spoke to you earlier from Scotland and who's seeing it in Manchester, brings us back to this Stratford production. Um, he's written, He his other question is that Tracy Ann Oberman is obviously Jewish and she's talked about how she really struggled with her Jewish identity until she played Golda in Fiddler on the Roof. Um, and by the way, her um, portrait of Golda in Fiddler on the Roof, which was, he didn't write this, this is my comment, which was at Chichester's Festival, um, was informed by a friend of hers who many of us, I think, know or knew, very sadly, she's no longer with us, but Maureen Kendler, who wrote for a long time for Jewish Renaissance. Um, uh. And she was the person who was the Jewish advisor on that production and helped Tracy Ann find her Jewish identity through playing Golda. But what Joe's asked is, do you think appearing in this play will further impact her Jewish journey and how might it impact? Um, I think that she's very involved in Jewish stuff. I just read a little bit about her today. I've never seen her act and I didn't watch East EastEnders, but she's very involved. She's got a, pl a play, a, a podcast or a radio program on BBC called Jews in Their Own Voices. And she's got something else that she was doing with, um, Jonathan Friedland, or maybe that's Jews in their own voices, and she's she's very very involved in in all this Jew, in Jewish um, stuff now. She, her granny lived in in the East End or so, or something, and and she draws upon her, her, her or her, her uncles were involved in the Cable Street riots. So she's she's got a deep background of of Jewish um, issues, and I think she's very very proud of 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 them. She seems to be. From what I could see, I, I don't know, I have to see the play first. From what I could see was she seems to be concentrating also on if you're Jewish and a woman. And she's she's saying that there's an extra layer and level of abuse if you not only Jewish, but also a woman. So mis misogyny, misogyny, misogyny <laughs> intersects with anti-Semitism. And that's what she's going to um investigate I, th I I guess but I'm not sure if I, I'm I'm not sure if I'm going to agree with that because I think this play is very much a play of empowerment of women so I, I don't know how she's going to get around that it's going to be interesting to see well we'll see next week right and for those of us who are coming on the trip maybe we'll ask her Joe's question and um 
see if there's a feedback. Um, so actually, someone's just put another question in the chat, and I think you came on slightly late. So someone's just put a question in the chat saying there's been no mention of that magnificent Israeli production that came to the globe a few years ago. But actually, that's exactly how Pam started, um, talking about sitting there and watching that um, dress rehearsal um, amidst all the controversy around anti-Semitism. And it was really an amazing and... production. It was it was a oh, it was a brilliantly yeah. powerful they tied Sherlock, they tied Antonio up like a Jesus Christ figure. It, it was very, very powerful. Oh, it was brilliantly done. Yes. And, and the beginning, starting with the children teasing Shylock in that ring and Shylock's uh, uh, and Jessica and, and Lorenzo escaping, or Jessica getting out of the window. And then the last scene with Jessica and Lorenzo again, and you think, oh, there's a marriage on the rocks there. Yeah, yeah, we didn't come. Yeah, we that. didn't. I didn't we, have time to discuss the marriage on the rocks, but there's yes. certainly a lot of of um, textual proof that they they you know they talk about all sorts of stuff from Greek mythology that, that not happy marriages and not happy stuff, and it seems as though and in in um um which production of it was they had Leonard Bernstein's Kaddish at the end. I think it was. I think it was in the Laurence Olivier production, the movie. Um, they had Jessica on a beach sort of looking out from, she's in Belmont at the end, looking back to Venice over the sea and holding her father's ring, which she's not supposed to have anymore, but she, in that production, she it was in Jonathan Miller's production of uh, his movie. And they have her sort of gloomily, glumly, traipsing along the beach with his Kaddish playing a, a clear message from Jonathan Wilson that uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Miller, Miller Jonathan Wilson Jonathan Miller um that that she'd made a mistake and she's regretting but that's just interpretation there's no evidence that she yeah. regretted you do get it a bit in her last speech in the last scene well, she's not happy with with him, but it doesn't. We don't know if she's would have been no, no. happy with her dad, but maybe. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. Um, one one thing that that uh, I I will always remember is I went to a meeting that uh, there were directors from all over the world, every country, or all, all, all over the place, and each one insisted that their version in their language of Shakespeare was the best wasn't the best the hungarian insisted that in Hunger hungarian it was the best version much better than in english the uh, french said no 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 in french of course the poles said no our version is much better and the russians said well you can't beat our version each one each one and and that made me aware of how i won't say international but how uh, I, I can't think of the word how for everyone uh, Shakespeare is an, universal. An, an, how universal it is. The language yeah, is sure. foreign even today. For yeah. sure. Mm. For sure. So what a fantastic place to end with that universality of Shakespeare, but also the, the complexities and interests surrounding this play. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward with Pam to meeting many of you next week in Stratford. But for those who can't be there, I would suggest you have a look back in JR's archives because not only do we have the interview between Henry Goodman and Tracy Ann, but we also have articles going back to 2016, that big Shakespeare anniversary, where I don't know if you remember, but there was the production of The Merchant of Venice in the Venice Ghetto. Um, and our critic Judy Herman wrote about it, including seeing Ruth Bader Ginsburg judging um, the legal discussion about whether or not Shylock or Antonio should win in court. Um, a whole range of things. Howard Jacobson commented, and he, in fact, recorded a television documentary about it. So there's lots and lots of material about this play going back in JR's archives that I think is very much worth exploring. Um, and I hope we'll continue the conversation. It sounds like there's lots of interest down the line. So who knows, maybe more Shakespeare and the Jews to come. 
But for now, just a massive thank you to Dr. Pamela Pallad. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, very much. you're unmuted as chance for us all to give our appreciation mm. in the usual way. <laughs> thank you. And we look thank forward you. to meeting you in person next week. <laughs> thank you very much. And Khati Matovat, Somkal, have an easy fast, everybody. Yeah, Khati Matovat, Somkal. And just to let you all know, the next event, it's not yet really publicised, but the next big event after the Stratford talk will be being advertised next week. Um, we'll be going to Berlin, the big passport feature for our October issue that's coming out in just under a month is on the history of Germany, of Jewish Germany, particularly East Germany, um, before the wall and since the wall has come down and how that's affected the Jewish community there. So we'll be looking at that on the 23rd of October and I do hope you'll join us then. Um, thank you much, er very much, everybody. Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Tikatevu. Thank you, Pamela. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank you.